right, if you want to turn to 1 John. 1 John, this is, I guess, our third, third week in 1 John. Last week, we spent a good bit of time talking about what does it look like to walk in the light as opposed to walking in the darkness. And we're going to pick up this week looking at verses 8 through 10 of chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. It's kind of interesting to follow John's writing because he kind of moves from one thought to the next thought to the next thought. And, and a lot of times you can see a connection, but it might be a direction that you and I, if we're trying, if we're thinking of writing it along, we might write it a different way. Um, but here we're picking up. The last verse we looked at, the very end of verse 7, says the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And we mentioned last week that word sin is mentioned 27 times in just five chapters. Um, pretty important concept. The idea of sin and being set free from it and cleansed from it. So look at verses 8 through 10. If we claim to be without sin, well, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and <coughs> purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. And his word has no place in our lives. Well, as we've already pointed out early on in this, John writes in stark contrast. So last week it was light, darkness. This week uh, it, is, it is forgiveness and, and being guilty of our sin and, and those standing uh, in stark contrast. And he's, and he's saying pretty closely, clearly, that if we're walking with the Lord, if we're walking in the light, we're going to be experiencing the forgiveness of sin. And if we say we don't have sin, he says that doesn't even calculate when it comes to who we are in relationship to God. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? But if you look at verse 9, that's, that's a very familiar verse to us in, in the gospel, or in, in 1 John. If we confess our sins, he's faithful, and he's just, and he will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. I want us to think a few minutes about what it is to confess our sins. What it is, what, what we think John would refer to. Confessing our sins, what, what the scriptures refer to when it comes to confessing our sins. Um, because the promise is, if we confess, we're forgiven. And we're not only forgiven, we're purified. We're cleansed. We're, we're ready to start fresh and anew. And I, I think of the, the verse in Psalm 103, uh, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our sins from us. So if you were to, to, to begin to think about what is it to confess our sins, what would that entail? I think when prayer, you, you, ask, you tell God that you know that you sinned and you ask him to forgive you for your sins. Okay, so it starts with being honest. With ourselves, it starts with with uh, taking a a good look at us, uh, allowing God to, to speak to us through His Spirit about who we are, and 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 if we if we're followers of Christ, His Spirit's going to speak to us pretty clearly and quickly if if we're connected. And then you don't re you try not to repeat your sins. So and you ask God to help you. So repentance is a part of this. It's confession, coming clean, repentance, turning away from. I mean, it's, it's the heart of I'm not going back there. It's the heart of I don't like where I am. I need to get back 
in the right relationship. Okay, he what knows else? if you're halfway doing it. I mean, he knows yeah. if you say, oh, Lord, you know, forgive me for sin number X, and in you, and your back of your <laughs> mind, you're like, I'm still going to do that tomorrow, yeah. and I just need to be forgiven today. You know, you're not, you don't really have any intention of really stopping whatever it is. I think all of us can, can, can identify with what Katie is talking about. Uh, we know when we mean business, and we know when we don't. And, you know, that's, that's something that, that is a part of this. I mean, uh, repentance has, has to do with this is dead wrong, I've done wrong, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to go back there. I don't want to be there. Now, may, and I think every one of us can probably connect with this, I think sometimes we have to confess, God, I don't want to go back there, and I don't know how not to. I think we have to be honest about that. I mean, there are times we just say, I really don't want to be there. But I know me. And I know that in certain situations at certain times, that's going to come right back at me. And I don't know what to do about it. I think that's part of being open. Part of being honest. And I think that's very different from trying to play games. Remember, remember way back when that I don't even remember what it was about. It might have been butter. Uh, you can't you can't fool Mother Nature, that <laughs> commercial. Uh, you know, that's kind of what comes to mind. We 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 somehow, because we can fool one another, we tend to think we can pull the wool over God's eyes. And he lives in us as followers of Christ, his, his spirit. Yeah, Carol. And the, the, the rest of that is he will remember them no more. That's right. That's right. He puts them as far away as, and isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Oh, my. Trick is that we have to forget. Yes. We have yes. to forgive ourselves. Well, and, and, and that's kind of where, that's where this is going. In the idea that that not only are we forgiven, we're purified, and purified carries with it the idea of it's done. God's finished with it. He's already he's already dealt with it. Um, he's it speaks of God being. We haven't finished this discussion on confession yet. He's faithful and just. Is there a, anybody have a translation other than the NIV in verse nine? Faithful and just. Any other word besides faithful, just? Faithful and reliable. Faithful and reliable. Fair. Fair. What verse is that? Verse 9. Okay, he's got just. Just carries with it the, ter the, the, the concept that's very strong that sin has to be dealt with. It has to be accounted for. There has to be a judgment upon sin. And, of course, how did that happen? That's, that's through Christ. And we're actually going to get into that as we go along here. But there are arguments about what mm -hmm. is or isn't a sin within many churches. Mm -hmm. And what is a sin to one person is not to another. Mm -hmm. We kind of talked about that Sunday morning in the, in the, in the sermon uh, when we were uh, uh, looking at uh, 1 Corinthians 10. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything's permissible, but not everything's constructive. And, uh, and, and Paul there did speak about, he was, he was using the idea of, of meat offered to idols. And, and, and you know, he's saying, in quoting Psalm 24, 1, it's okay. I mean, it's from God. But he said, but to another brother or sister in Christ, it might not be okay. If it's not okay with them, and you sit down to eat with them, don't, don't offer what they find offensive. And, and there's, there's an idea, and he's, he talks about it there, that, that if, if we can scripturally, if we find we're okay with whatever that might be, Scripturally, there's nothing in Scripture that is opposed to it. 
and our conscience is clear and we can do it with with um, a clear heart that that actually you know he, he, he's speaking about the the meat offered to idols he, he talked about thanking God for it and if we can thank God for it go for it as long as it's not contradictory to scripture yeah we're going to disagree as shoot even even in our congregation but uh, you know as far as as far as what is sin is as far as what is sinful not 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 we're not talking about we're not talking about the, the Ten Commandments and the and the the basic heart of the message but um, like clothing how to be holy right yeah. how how we were dressed to come to worship let, let's just I'm, I'm not going to get into this big long discussion tonight but uh, social drinking. What 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 one group would say is is a sin, another group would say it's not, and both of them have biblical proof texts and concepts, and that's that's kind of that kind of thing is what I'm talking about. See, um, I don't know where the scripture is, but I think Paul said it. Uh, if if you perceive it as sin. And that, that's pretty much what we're talking First Corinthians ten twenty three murder and rape right. and all that. But right. I mean subtle right. things like uh, well smoking. Uh, another thing in the early church, we're talking about circumcision of the Gentiles. I mean that's that was another thing. Um, the wearing of makeup. Yeah. Different churches yeah. have and 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 you can you can with makeup and jewelry you can go to scripture and use the instrument. You can find yeah, use so, the but let's let's get back to confession. <laughs> <laughs> um, Confessing these perceived. Let me suggest there's a couple of other things that 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 when we when we biblically confession is is being open and honest. It's repenting. It's turning away from. Uh, it it also carries the idea of restitution. Of making things right. If if I've hurt you or I've done something to you and 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 I've sinned against you, then I need to not only ask for your forgiveness, I need to make it right as much as I possibly can. Um, I think that's something we don't talk about as much as, as we really need to. Uh, one of the things I've always found fascinating about the 12 steps of AA is, I mean, it's it's like it's like a point by point exposition on biblical repentance. Um, it's a big deal in that twelve steps to make things right with others as much as you possibly can. Not to where you're going to do more harm by trying to make it right, because there are some situations where that would be the case as well. But restitution, and and you, you've already mentioned it, but the idea of resolve. To move forward, to not go back. All of that is, is in this concept of biblical confession. Um, and and it's, it's, that is the heart attitude that takes us forward in our walk with the Lord. Uh, otherwise, we do find ourselves repeating over and over and over the same things and not moving forward. So if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I love Carolyn's concept. It's done. You can, you can mark it out. Any, anything else come to your mind when you think about the whole purification Any other word you see in that in that verse besides purify? Translate it any other way. Cleanse. Cleanse. Isn't that a beautiful and isn't that the beautiful picture of baptism? The symbolic action of, of going under the water, coming up out of the water, cleansing. 
Every one of us have faced at some point in our lives a point of great forgiveness of God. And, and, and one of the things that I always think of when I think of is just being able to breathe again. Just feeling the weight lifted off of our shoulders. A fresh start. I mean, what? how beautiful is that to be able to do that? And how good God is to, to offer that to us. Um, any other thoughts about those verses? Yeah. Um, they're not specifically about these verses, but in Paul, did he say, I um, may be wrong, 8th chapter of Romans, um, and he says, I don't want to do bad. I will myself not to do bad, but in my limbs, I see sin. Chapter 7, and, and yes, he, he says, yeah. That, but, the, but the key point at the bottom of that was that, who, who, oh Lord, who will save me from this body of death? I thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Thanks be to God for his son Jesus. Absolutely. Yep. And that's who, that's who sets us free from that. Yeah. Yeah. One thing, Joel, when you're asking about confessing your sins, you have to you have to ask him to bring to your mind to show you sometimes mm -hmm. the sins that you that you're not really aware of yeah. or you didn't realize, I don't know, you know, that yeah. you may have hurt somebody or I don't know, something uh, that things we aren't aware we've even done. Yeah. Blind spots that we have. You know, and, and I'm not asking you to answer this out loud, but but think about it. How what what role does honest confession to God play in your prayer life? How often does that happen? And and how often do we make that a part of just just to stay in that place where we're dealing with the sin in our lives? Um, That he, he continues the thought. Let's go to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's some strong stuff, isn't it? That's, that's, that's powerful, what he's saying there. Jesus is a lot more powerful than people give him credit for. He is. He is. He's very powerful. If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. An advocate. Um, the, the New King James and the English Standard Version both use the word advocate. There. It's like a court. Uh, the Greek is paraclete. And if you go back to, uh, to John 14, where, where Jesus first talks about the coming of the comforter, the counselor, uh, it's the word paraclete. And it does carry a connotation of a court of law, a defense attorney, the one who's our advocate, who stands on our behalf. Um, it's really a, a wonderful, beautiful thought, concept of, of who Jesus is. Yeah, Jane? Well, you know, it's an important part of our prayer life because if we go by the Acts, mm -hmm. A-C-T-S, I mean, after your adoration, you got to confess, and I've been in a lot of studies where it's kind of like, if you don't confess your sins, then the rest of what you're saying is just gibberish, and it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> and your thoughts are? I think God can choose to hear whatever he wants to hear and respond. Well, and it's, a good, it's a good yes, practice. Yes, yes I, and I've often spoke of adoration, confession, yes. thanksgiving, supplication. Uh, and, and the supplication is what we typically do in our prayer life. Right. Uh, how much time do we spend in adoration? How much time do we spend in confession, in thanksgiving? Uh, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's uh, well, in the, in the 
Lord's Prayer. It's about there's there's that point where we confess and come clean. Absolutely, it it is a part. My I I just reacted the way I did just because I know I hear that a lot, and I I'm just not sure I agree with that. I'm not sure it's. Well, I don't always do it. I have to admit that sometimes I get something's on my mind and I, I don't do that. But I always feel better when I do follow that little. Oh, and, you know, we, yeah, we all always it feel just better. Seems to be a. I don't know. It does seem like oh, okay, this is this is the way it's supposed to be done. It's, it's better than to get start asking for stuff yeah. and you know. Yeah, it's cleansing. Yeah, Larry. Um, this verse who? Mm-hmm. He is the propitiation for our sins. Mm -hmm. Our refers to believers. Mm -hmm. And not for ours, and that also refers to believers. Right. Not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Right. The whole world. What does that mean? What's that last phrase mean? In, in, in that, I would see John 3, 16. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him. I mean, he... When yeah. Jesus came, he came for the whole world. But John 3.16 does not so clearly juxtapose believers mm -hmm. with the rest of the world. This says, he's a propitiation mm -hmm. for the sins of believers, but not for the sins of believers only, but right. for the whole world. That's the way I read that. Right, and, and, and I think that's how it reads. Now, yeah. what does that mean? Yeah, that's my question. And and and, and, that, and I'm I'm saying that what I'm what I'm seeing in this, especially contextually, is he's he's given he has done what's necessary for anybody to have forgiveness. Well, or do you read that to say he is propitiation propitiation for our sins, believers, and not for believers only, but also for other believers? My my literally says, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Right, but you, do you read the sins of the whole world as sins of other believers? Mm. I see that as, if, if I go back, and for example in verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Um, if we claim we have not sinned, verse 10, we make him out to be a liar and the word has no place in our lives. I just simply hear him saying, Christ, God through Christ has done everything necessary for the salvation of anybody in the world that chooses to accept it. But I don't see him saying that it's a blanket forgiveness for everybody. Uh, the, the parallel question there might be when Jesus, uh, how does it play when Jesus is on the cross and he, and he literally prays and says, Father, forgive me. They don't know what they do. Right. What do we make of that? I mean, right. I mean, do, 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 does that mean that, that only people who later believe are forgiven? Or does that mean that Jesus' prayer is then and there answered? I, I, I mean, I really mm -hmm. think this verse is, is hard to, to it's hard. I, I think sometimes we bring our theology to the Bible mm -hmm. instead of taking we do. it from, from the Bible. We you do. know what I mean? Uh -huh. And I, I can't read this to say he's a propitiation for our sins, our uh, us being believers, right? And not for believers only, but also for the whole world. So, and I don't read that to mean not not for ours only, but for other believers only. I I, I, I think that does violence to what's said. He came, now, he came know, maybe, for everybody. Maybe that's not. Um, not what he meant, but it sure is hard to get around that, I think. Just reading it literally. You're, so what you're seeing there is is blanket forgiveness. For is, that, is that Christ's sacrifice is effective, period. And does that make, and, and, and I would agree with that. Yeah. But, 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 but there's a point it. where it's a, it's a two-way street here. I understand that's our theology. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, that's the way I've been brought up. Mm -hmm. But I think that verse doesn't fit that. Perhaps something was lost in the translation. Uh, I don't think. I, I think this is exactly what he wrote. Mm -hmm. I, I guess my encouragement there would be 
contextually, not just right here, but contextually in all of the New Testament. Right. For example, the book of Romans, the book of Hebrews. When you look at those two books, it's, it's clear that not everybody, I mean, Jesus himself talked about, about ultimate destruction of, of people who, um, who, who reject. And I feel like that's all the way through the, the New Testament. I don't think that theology came about. I think it came about because of what Scripture says. Well, you know, you, you talk about encouragement. Mm -hmm. you, you find encouragement in that. Mm -hmm. I find encouragement in the idea that the, the sacrifice of Jesus is effective, period, universal. I mean that, and I, I understand that that's right. not what we learn, right. and that's not Reformation theology. I understand right. that. Right. Uh, maybe not even Orthodox theology, but I think this verse hints at that, and I think it. I, I think that it's hard to say that that's not encouraging. Well, see, I would find it very encouraging. I would too. But in the sense that he's done what's necessary. Yeah. It's just a matter of, I mean, the, the, there is a response from us that's that's requested. Um, I think I think Romans three, starting with twenty three and going down, talks about a response that's necessary. Um, but one th one thing I would encourage you to do with with that, and and even. And if you want to come back and share it, would be to see where else in the in the scriptures in the New Testament do you see that thought that that you're seeing there? This isn't the only place. Okay. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't mean to imply at all mm -hmm. that there is any means of salvation outside of Christ. I don't mean to. <coughs> right. I know. I know. You, you know where I'm coming yeah. from. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that, that salvation is. In Christ and in Him only. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Phil. So I, I, under, I can read into what he's saying, but to me, when it, the last part says not only for ours only, but also for the sin of the world, ties back to John three sixteen, which is he who believeth in Him. Right. And without believers. that belief, it doesn't matter. Right. Because you, you know you go to the pit of fire. So. Right. Well, he, he's forgiven the sins of the whole world but if they don't embrace him they ha can't get the forgiveness for the sins so yeah it's for us as believers it's also for the whole world but if they shun it then you know it, it's, it goes kind of back to the if somebody did you wrong just forgive them I don't do that they have to come to me and ask me for forgiveness. Because okay. carte blanche forgiveness is a deity. I'm not a deity. I can't do that. Okay. Do you suppose that, you know, we have the idea that, that um, Christ came for not only the Jews, but also the Gentiles? Mm -hmm. So do you suppose that it, he also could be referring to that Well, I think definitely it includes that concept because he, he is talking about all save for the sins of the whole world. Right. And, and, and the idea of the world in John's writings, uh, it, it means a couple of different things. Uh, here it's just talking about people. Later on, he's going to be using the word world in terms of its, its system of thought, its way of doing things, its values, its mores. That's, that's over later in the second chapter. But then in John 3.16, world is speaking of people. You know, we, we, are, we, are the, we are the world. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, that's going back in time. Isn't it? Uh, so, okay. Good, good discussion. Anything else you want to bring up? Let me, let, me, let me ask this question. 
How is Jesus our defense? How is he our paraclete, our advocate? I think about people in the hospital, whether it's kids or <clears throat> an older person that maybe has dementia and they and they need an advocate because they need somebody mm -hmm. to tell people how to help them. Right. And that, to me, Jesus comes between us and, and he, he, he helps convey to the yeah. Father our needs because he, he, you know, the, they know him better than we do and he takes our our thoughts and, and, and speaks up for us in that, in that regard. Absolutely. And he's the, he is our mediator. I, I have trouble with this one too. <laughs> hey, imagine. Because, because, because I've seen the lawyers do right. for people who are about to be judged. And they try to explain things away. Mm -hmm. They try to minimize it. They try to say, but he's good this way and that way. Mm -hmm. I don't see judgment with God working that way at all. No. I don't see, I don't see uh, you know, God saying, well, you know, yeah, you did these sins, but you know, you volunteered at the blood bank or whatever. You know, oh, absolutely that's, not. That's, no. you know, that's the picture I get when I, t when I hear an advocate. I, advocate is someone who, you know, tries to make your case, and I don't see this that way at all. The case is Jesus. Right. It's not us. Right. Well, it says he in verse two, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now that I'm and that's the explanation that of him being a paraclete. I get that part. I mean that is that is what that is. He stepped into our place. So he took our sin upon himself. So I'm sorry. He took our judgment upon himself. I mean he did the whole deal. So if, if we're looking at the analogy to an advocate or a lawyer, the lawyer in this case would not be saying good things about my client or explaining away what he did. He would rather say, judge, judge me, right. not my client. Right. That's what's Well, and, and, I, and I really think that's what you're hitting at when you're talking about Jesus stepping in. He is, how, he is our entryway yeah. to the presence of the Father. I mean, uh, that's... He made the restitution for sure. our sins. I see it very simply as Jesus steps in between us and God and says, stop. I died for this person. This person accepted my mm -hmm. gift. And it's finished. Good close he can. Good close you know. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He who knew no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I mean, it needs to, to me. That's a that's a verse that just very simply says what this is all about, right here. Yeah. A man in Texas explained it to me this way. I kind of kept it with me. It goes kind of with what he said about the court thing. He said, imagine a court, you know, the size of the world. Everybody's there, and you come up, and the prosecutor is Satan and the defense attorney is Jesus, and God is the judge. And Satan comes up and says, I've had this person doing this, I've had this person doing that, I've had this person doing this, I've had this person doing that. And he gets done with this big spiel, and Jesus stands up and says, Father, he's in the book of life. She's in the book of life. I have this, this person. Because of? Yeah, this person. Is because of what he's done. And so that just nullifies everything that the prosecution has done, and that person goes, yeah. and he is our advocate. And I've used him as advocate to personally come before okay. God. Okay. And it works. Were you, so one of you two want to say something? I was just simply going to say, God can stand no sin, bear no sin. Right. He's holy. And because of the fact that we have sinned, the only way for us to ever approach God is to have that advocate of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. He, you know, by taking on that sin, now we can approach the Absolutely. Father. We have no way, no way into the presence of, of the Father, into heaven. No way. Except for Jesus. And, and, and everything that's at the very core of the Christian faith, that's the message. He, he is our way in. Okay. 
Anything else before we wrap up? I, I don't want to start the next the next section to get to the obedience. <laughs> you do. It's much more fun talking about how bad we are. <laughs> about how we find forgiveness and cleansing and purity and, and, and salvation and righteousness in you. Check out, check out the next four verses and keep following on along. Okay. All right. Let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. Good discussion. Who would that stand? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time. We thank you for your word. We thank you more than anything for your son Jesus and, and all that he means to us and all that he's done to show your great love for us. Lord, keep us in your word. Keep us, keep us open to what you would have us learn and, and how you would have us grow. But also keep our eyes wide open, God, for those that are searching and seeking that, that you might use us, that we might be your vessels, your ambassadors to reach them. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.